Hello everyone, uh, my name is Michał Ślaski. I work at Erlang Solutions and today I will talk about uh, a chat feature. I'm gonna chat about a chat feature, about some chat protocols, uh, chat servers, uh, and some tests that we have executed on the chat server that I want to talk about. So uh, you can see I'm in a very chatty mood today. Uh, I will also be available to chat after my talk if you like. So what is chat feature that I'm here? It's, it's a text-based communication between two or more users. Uh, uh, some of you may remember uh, the Talk, which was a Unix-based application where you could talk with other users, log in in the same system. It would split your screen into two. And then we have some other um, applications like IRC channels, which would allow many users to communicate. And over the years, those messengers evolved. So we, you got uh, ICQ, which was a desktop application, uh, AOL, instant messengers. Nowadays, um, those messengers integrate not only text, but they integrate voice, video, your geolocation, um, you name it. Everything is available, integrated. You can see uh, 12 people speaking at the same time. And not only messengers use this chat feature. The ability to chat with other fellows is actually an interesting social feature. Uh, so social networking providers integrate a chat feature in their applications too. You can see Facebook chat, uh, Google Talk, and Katalk. Uh, there are also some other new applications popping up like uh, Talk TV, uh, for example, where it's about the baseball gameplay, but with some additional social twist where you can chat with your um, colleagues while watching the game. Or Big Life, where you can comment uh, some movie and watch the movie with other people. So again, it's, it's the chat feature added to some other application, uh, which makes it uh, more social. And you have games. You will have in-game chat systems, uh, just to enable uh, people to talk uh, and put together teams which will fight dragons or communicate uh, uh, during the gameplay. So again, games, as we can see, especially online, mul online multiplayer games, they adapted this chat uh, feature, and this is another use case for it. So having all this in mind, um, and choosing, picking the right protocol to satisfy all those different uh, use cases, uh, such protocols should cater to the web, most of the games are now played on the web, uh, mobile devices, um, or even machine-to-machine -machine use cases. Because, um, as I will explain later, uh, some of the features of chat protocols can be used also for other than chat purposes. Okay, in this talk, I want to say a few words about XMPP, which is one of the instant messaging protocols. How many of you have heard of XMPP? Okay, that's good. I have, do have some slides which uh, quickly go through some of the XMPP features and the history. Um, it started over 10 years ago. Uh, initially it was uh, Jabber, uh, which was invented by Jeremy Miller. And then it got standardized. Uh, some first projects started to be implemented, uh, including eJabberD, which has started over 10 years ago. Um, once it was standardized, some of the big players started to adopt it. Like in 2005, we got a Google Talk uh, released, which was based on XMPP. Mm. At the same time, uh, Google also proposed some extensions to XMPP. Uh, there is nowadays XMPP Standards Foundation, uh, which meets twice a year, and they discuss uh, additional extensions to the XMPP protocol. Uh, it's actually a very friendly group of people I had a chance to meet recently. And then over the years, actually XMPP is de facto becoming a standard for messaging because um, some other big uh, companies that offer messengers start to integrate with it or offer some XMPP uh, features. So you have uh, Facebook chat uh, to which you can connect over XMPP. Um, Microsoft uh, also released an interface to XMPP um, and so on and so on. And the reason why this is so widely adopted is because it's an open standard it's probably one of the key features. Uh, 
uh, it's secure, meaning you have some channel encryption or, or strong authentication algorithms. Uh, you can also isolate your network from public if you need. Um, it's quite flexible, meaning that you can reasonably easily extend standard features of XMPP. So um, this is why people keep on adding new proposals uh, for new extensions and over time they get standardized so others can use this, the standards that um, have been in use for some years now. Mm, it's decentralized, meaning there is no central server to manage. Uh, servers federate with each other and this makes it really scalable. Um, efficient in a sense that uh, having some persistent TCP connection actually solve some of the issues of polling approaches. Uh, and, well, I would say it's proven simply because it has been used for, for so many years. And today you have millions of users that do use XMPP every day. I have a few more slides explaining mm, the concepts behind XMPP. Mm, here's how you identify a client. It's, it looks very much like an email address. Uh, it has this extra bit at the end, which is called resource ID. This is how you can differentiate between different connections of the same user who may be connecting from mobile, desktop, and, well, home at the same time. And then this is an XML-based protocol, uh, which has some three fundamental um, elements, XML elements. One is for messaging. It's a message kind of element. This is the one that you will use for sending messages to users or to group chats. Uh, this is how it looks like. And the good thing is that actually server who maintains the connection with a user and authenticated the user in the first place, uh, this is the server that stamps all the messages originating from users. So there's no um, risk of having some spam being sent because uh, this is the user who first authenticated the user uh, and then all the messages originating from this user will be, will be stamped. So we have also presence, another um, piece of uh, this protocol, which will allow you to announce that you're now available for chat or maybe you're online but currently busy. So presence, this is actually a very interesting feature um, which may be used in many different use cases. It's, um, and one more here, one more element of the protocol is uh, info query, which is quite similar to what HTTP is. So you will have requests originating from a, a client and a response coming back from the server. Uh, all requests have some unique uh, ID attribute uh, and you will differentiate, well, you will decide what the request uh, is about uh, by the namespace used in this request. So for example, here in the slide we have a uh, client asking server to provide him his uh, roster. And people keep on extending this protocol by adding some custom namespaces, extending the body of those IQ messages. So a lot of uh, custom functionality can be built with this uh, IQ part of the protocol. And this is also why XMPP is used not only for instant messaging, but also for remote system control, signaling, even voice over IP and, and other things. There are many XMPP servers. Uh, as usual, some of those are more widely adopted, some others maybe less. Uh, one of the most widely adopted server out there is uh, eJabberD, which, uh, started, uh, which was started over 10 years ago. It is written in Erlang, uh, cross-platform, and the interesting feature is that it can be distributed on a cluster, either because of uh, well, scaling requirements or because of fault tolerance, if you like. And another good thing about this project is because it has been in development for so many years, it implements quite a few extensions that have been standardized. So you will find support for all sort of different databases and authentication mechanisms, and many other extensions. However, if you want to scale eJabberD to really big numbers, uh, it will not scale out of the box. There are some limitations to its architecture, uh, like one of them is uh, that all the sessions of all the users 
within the cluster are replicated on all the nodes, which the more nodes you add to the cluster, the more RAM each node should have, which may be limiting at some point. Uh, because you can keep on adding nodes, but you cannot keep on adding RAM. And also, if you use XMPP for web applications, the, the web long polling may be not efficient enough. Currently, EJBRD, at least the open source version of it, supports Bosch only, which is XMPP over um, long polling. And we, having seen these uh, limitations and also uh, working with EJBRD for quite many years, uh, we decided to fork the project. We actually spoke with the people behind the Jabber D whether we could uh, contribute to the project, but it turned out that some of the changes that we proposed were too revolutionary and they would probably break some of the backward compatibility with Jabber D, which is why we <coughs> created a fork of Jabber D. And here we focused on first making it work for Erlang developers. Uh, how many of you are Erlang developers here? Okay, all right. So for those of you who did work with Erlang already, uh, you will appreciate being able to create proper Erlang releases as in OTP principles or uh, having the layout uh, be Rebar-like so that you can also easily integrate other open source projects based on Rebar build tool. And, and there are other things into it which make EJBRD uh, more OTP compliant. So this is one focus. Another one is uh, performance and scalability. So some of the issues that we have seen here have been solved. Uh, for example, the, the uh, RAM limitation of sessions, as mentioned on the previous slide, this could be solved by uh, replacing Nisha, uh, which is used for storing sessions, with external in-memory database like Redis. Um, or um, you could optimize uh, um, some of the data structures and other things just to lower the memory footprint, which will, again, allow you to scale to bigger numbers because you can fit more users within the same box. So Mongoose IM is uh, how we named this fork. Uh, it uh, implements some of the most popular XEPs. I mean, there are a lot of XEPs, but not all of them are always used. So we just, for, for the time being, we ported the ones which are most uh, popular, as we can see it. So like service discovery, multi-user chart, privacy lists, and also recently added a feature uh, where you can use XMPP over WebSockets. Another thing we added is uh, um, a suite of tests, uh, regression tests, which comes very handy when you want to build on top of this fork. Uh, so we actually see Mongoose as a great baseline for building custom XMPP services. You have all the right pieces in place, not only Rebar and OTP, but also regression tests, uh, and actually we have seen over the years that every time somebody is trying to use EJBRD in production in his project, he has to adapt the project anyway for his custom needs. Um, so we see Mongoose as a great baseline for, for building such. Okay, mm, I promised some load tests here, so here are some slides about load testing, and just to also give you an idea how, uh, how we can to what numbers we can scale on a single box. Uh, the box we had uh, was uh, an 8-core AMD with 32 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, it was running the latest open source EJBRD, uh, Mongoose IM, the latest one as well, as well as some other uh, software as on the slide. We used Tsung for stress testing, which is an open source uh, load testing tool, also written in Erlang, and it can distribute uh, load on many nodes, so we actually could use many nodes to generate the traffic and try to kill this one machine. Okay, and we use the same configuration for both EJBRD and Mongoose uh, because this, uh, this bit is kept uh, backward compatible. Um, all the sessions in Nisia, all the users, uh, user credentials in an external MySQL database, and the same for rosters. So we are using the same configuration file. Uh, had to tweak uh, the Erlang VM a bit just to enable uh, so many users connected to, the, to one box. So we had to enable maximum number of Erlang processes, uh, Erlang ports, and, and so on. Um, and one of the first tests we ran was to 
mm, see how many users we can fit on such a box. Uh, to make it a bit more realistic, we uh, populated all users' rosters with 100 buddies. Uh, so, well, we assume that 100 is a good number of friends. Maybe you have more on your LinkedIn account. Um, and here's one of the results. Mm, we can see number of connected users over time. Uh, as you can see, actually, EJBRD as it is in 2.1 version uh, started to lose some of the users over time. It could not keep up with the same uh, login rate. Uh, you can see also some CPU utilization here, uh, where it just uh, takes a bit more effort for EJBRD to log in those users, and this is why some of the users are dropped and, and connections are lost. Um, and another one shows the memory footprint, where uh, the lower the better. Uh, so you can f we can fit all those 400,000 users within something like 22, 23 gigabytes of RAM, while uh, those almost 400,000 users would require almost three, 30 gigabytes of RAM for EJBRD. So having those memory optimizations, some CPU optimizations, we can actually log in more users quicker and have some spur capacity. And there are some other slides here, at least for this test, where we show uh, what was the connection request. And you can see that if, if there is an overload condition, actually the system still can cope with it, but just that the service performance downgrades. Uh, and this is why you see uh, something like three seconds. This is how long it takes to log in a user under heavy load. Um, OK, we can see also another test on my next slide, uh, where instead of trying to log in as many users as possible, we actually try to send and push as much traffic as possible. So that we now we logged in less users, only 75,000, but uh, we are now trying to send a lot of traffic. And the peak is uh, 21,000 messages per second. It, it's a flat um, rate at some point of the test. And let's see how this one goes. In this test, we, we have two phases. One is the arrival phase, where we have to log in all the users. It takes time, actually, for all of them to log in. Then we wait a little bit, and then we start sending messages. So after some time, in, in the, on the right-hand side of this uh, slide, you can see that this is where, where we are sending now 21,000 messages per second in total for all the users that managed to log in. And this is what we get. So we already have seen this behavior on the previous slides, where it takes a bit less CPU resources for Mongoose to log in users. Later on, it's almost the same, and both can cope with the same, with, with 21,000 messages per second. In terms of RAM, actually, there are some savings here for Mongoose. Um, over time, it's not so much of a difference, but there is a peak of RAM uh, for EJBRD, and it's always better to have this line smoother rather than having some peaks. Um, so again, it's not a huge difference, but actually sometimes it can make can make a big difference, especially if you have a storm of users logging in and storming your uh, server. So this is just to give you an idea how XMPP implementation in well, Mongoose or EJBRD can scale to what numbers on a single box over TCP. So this is a use case for maybe PC games or some other desktop applications or mobile applications. As we know, TCP is not an option for web applications, so I will now explore some of the techniques on how you can connect such uh, chat clients over web. There are different techniques. We have heard about some of them during previous presentation, like long polling, web sockets, uh, server send events, socket I.O. As far as XMPP is concerned, uh, long polling and web sockets have been used. Uh, long polling have been in use for many years now. Uh, it's called Bosch, and uh, the other one, the WebSockets one, as WebSockets as a standard actually was evolving over the last few years. Uh, it's also not yet fully standardized, 
but um, I can see uh, WebSockets gaining some popularity within the XMPP community nowadays. And the community is actually of, of an opinion, at least those were the opinions I have heard during last XMPP summit, is that WebSockets will pretty quickly replace Bosch completely. Uh, you still have to keep Bosch, I guess, for many applications, because WebSockets cover, uh, not co don't cover 90% um, of the market yet, but I think we are quickly getting there. And because WebSockets are about sending messages, it's uh, quite natural for XMPP, as this X XMPP is about the same. Um, I know of two JavaScript libraries for XMPP that do support WebSockets. There is JSJack, and it supports WebSockets in the master branch. There's also Strophy.js, which supports WebSockets in, in some branch. Uh, and it has not been integrated with master yet, but I guess it's just on the roadmap. And if you wonder whether WebSockets are already uh, there, uh, here is a slide which uh, shows what is the status as of today, uh, how widely WebSockets are adopted. Uh, it actually has changed a lot over the last 12 months. You can see that the current versions of all the popular web browsers do support WebSockets. And, and it's slightly worse for mobile um, devices where not all um, browsers would support WebSockets. For example, the native uh, Android one does not support WebSockets yet. Uh, but again, I strongly believe that it's a matter of a couple of time, a month's time where we will see uh, WebSockets picking up. So now, in this one more test we have here, we will try to compare WebSockets versus Bosch, which is long polling, as I said, just to see whether there's any advantage of using WebSockets. Mm. And today, uh, Mangoose supports WebSockets, but it doesn't Bosch. EJBRD supports Bosch, but it doesn't support WebSockets. So we had to uh, compare mm, those two servers again. Uh, you can see the blue line uh, for Bosch, as in EJBRD, and green and red lines for Mongoose over TCP and Mongoose over WebSockets. You see the difference is really big. Uh, this, is, this slide presents CPU utilization. Mm. And as you can see, the, the actually WebSockets behave more or less the same as regular TCP. So this is good. So the numbers that we have seen previously for TCP, where we were able to scale up to, well, 400,000 users, those are more or less the same numbers that we could see for WebSockets. Uh, and another slide with uh, memory footprint. This is even worse for Bosch, at least the one that we can find in EJBRD today. Uh, it, the, the login phase, the arrival phase where users log in, this generates a lot of uh, memory overhead and can be just too expensive uh, for, some of the for some deployments. So when we are talking about scaling IAM services, having WebSockets, which are s rather smooth here, uh, this actually gives you a better way uh, to plan capacity of the system and, and predict behavior of the system. The more users you can fit within the same machine, the better. Because routing messages between users which are sitting on the same machine is cheap. Having well, whatever, JabberD or Mongoose deployed in a cluster setup where you have nodes that you need to send uh, messages between, this is more expensive. And so the, the more users you can fit with in, within one machine, the better. Okay? Mm. So, I have some conclusions here. Um, I see chat feature being adopted not only in, within messengers, but also in social networking, games, and actually the, the, the same concept of uh, ch chat feature is hijacked by other than IAM applications for, as I, well, machine control, VoIP, and others. Um, XMPP is one of the most widely adopted uh, IAM protocols out there, um, and it's open standard. And I can also see this being used in both games and then some web applications. Uh, if you're talking about web, 
at least in our tests, uh, WebSockets are definitely more efficient than Bosch and hopefully by all the browsers that uh, are being <coughs> used out there will catch up with the latest WebSocket implementations because uh, at least for XMPP this is uh, the future. And we have Mangoose.im. If you would like to contribute to the project, it is uh, on GitHub under ESL eJabrD. Uh, we also build some packages for Mangoose for different uh, distros. You can download them from Erlang Solutions. And well, contact us if you, if you would like to well, see how you can see a fit for it. OK, that was pretty much it. Thank you. I will be now available for some questions. Questions? <coughs> what live deployments are there? Say again? What live deployments are there at the moment right now? What other? What live deployments are there that you can talk about? Live so live what live, live deployments are there? Live deployments, there sorry, thank you. So about. the question is what are the live deployments that we can talk about? Um, we, well, we've seen some, there are some uh, use cases published on erlangsolutions.com. For example, when it comes to um, Bosch, there was one uh, deployed uh, for NKTOK, which is the biggest Polish uh, social website. Uh, they've been scaling to something like 10 to 13 million online users. Uh, we, have, we also have uh, uh, Uvu, which is one of the uh, modern messengers, uh, it also has been used there to power the chat feature. Um, and there are some other, which I, which will probably be published on the website over the next few weeks. <coughs> on your stress test, you were using the last test, right? Correct. And what about chat rooms? How the system uh, is behaving when uh, testing with the chat rooms? So we, when porting some of the eJabrD features over to Mongoose, we always uh, profile them as f and stress, do some stress testing before uh, uh, putting them on the Mongoose branch. Um, during summer this year, we've been working on porting multi-user chat feature uh, and doing some stress tests. I, I, c I can share some test results if you like. And we found some serialization issues uh, which would prevent multi-user chat to scale to really big numbers. So, and some of those were removed while porting to Mongoose. Um, well, I have heard of uh, some adaptations of multi-user chat which can scale to uh, hundreds of thousands of users within the same chat room. Um, the ones that the stress tests we have run would have a couple of thousands of users within one chat room and m messages being sent every now and then. Of course, usually if you have that many human beings, it would be impossible to keep track of everybody chatting in the same. So then chat rooms are rather used as publish, subscribe kind of pattern. Uh, if we are talking about real human beings joining chat rooms, you, the traffic which appears on such is usually uh, not, that, not that big. I mean, you can have maybe a couple of hundred or maybe a thousand people but the traffic is rather minimal because otherwise no one would be able to. And what, the, what about the number of chat rooms that uh, uh -huh. in your system? It, oh, this, can, it's, this is many. This is really many because uh, the way it works is that uh, for each chat room there is one Erlang process. Uh, and as we have heard over the day today, um, you can scale to very many Erlang processes on, on a single box. So I would say as many as you can fit in the RAM. If you would like to see some exact numbers, I would be very happy to publish some uh, other test results which just didn't, uh, well, were not included in this presentation, but we had a chance to execute them in the past. So just uh, ping us on, on this email address or, or we will maybe publish it on the website anyway just to share with others. Thank you. Okay? Yes? Yeah, for example, video chat or file transfers, are they also using the same XMPP protocol or are they alphabet? Mm -hmm. So uh, back in 2005, when Google introduced Google Talk, they proposed some extensions to uh, XMPP called Jingle. Mm. And well, XMPP can be used for signaling, so like to uh, 
initiate some peer-to-peer -peer connection, but uh, sending files would be not efficient if done through the server. So some standard peer-to-peer -peer techniques are used here for uh, sending files or other media. And Jingle is used for signaling and negotiating this. OK? Yes? Mm -hmm. Well, for example, Google Wave uh, was a real-time collaboration experiment. Uh, it was based on XMPP2, as far as I know. Some extensions were proposed to XMPP. Uh, so this is a good example of, of such real-time collaboration. Uh, and yes, absolutely. I mean, I can see different, use, uh, different deployments of XMPP servers uh, where people don't even bother to publish some new standards uh, for the, to the foundation, but they actually do customize uh, XMPP for their specific needs uh, and transmit whatever they have to over the wire, which is inside of some XMPP stanza. For example, collecting um, power meters uh, from different places. Or, uh, yeah. so, so all sort of data can be transmitted uh, inside XMPP stanza, which is like a single message. And I have seen this done over and over again. And as a follow-up, you have IEM in the name. Is there a, in some reason, I mean, is there any reason why you can use Mongoose IEM for that sort of application? For what, sorry? Are there any reasons why you cannot use this for that sort of application since you have IEM in the name, or is it <laughs> just for? OK, we, <laughs> no, there's no reason not to use Mongoose IEM for other than IEM uh, use cases. <laughs> uh, well, this is. It's just a name that we decided to use. Um, but uh, it has been used for other than I am purpose. OK, yes? Actually, with, with the web chat uh, uh, connection pool, you have this problem of uh, multi-tab channels. Mm -hmm. And how does it change with the, with the web socket? Mm -hmm. is there is a concept of the shared uh, web workers, which is also part of HTML5, as far as I know. Um, there are actually already some mm, proposals in the XMPP community about how to use this shared web workers uh, to solve the problem you're describing, which is having multiple tabs, but trying to have the same um, like chat window across all the tabs and get this window synchronized on all the tabs every time you get one message. So again, one of the ideas here is to use so-called shared web workers, which is a feature of modern browsers. Uh, I'm not sure whether it is already adopted within all the modern browsers, but at least uh, some of them do uh, implement web workers. Um, that's one way of solving it. Uh, but did you solve that problem with Bosch? So with Bosch? Mm -hmm. I've seen, OK, so I've seen different. Uh, ways of solving the problem with Bosch here. Um, it could be that each tab actually separately subscribes uh, to its own channel and gets separate update. Um, this was one of the solutions that uh, has been introduced a few years back. Um, nowadays, I probably would start exploring this shared web worker, even though it's not, uh, it doesn't cover probably 100% of the market. I would start with it and see uh, how far we can get with such approach, and then maybe try to see what, how to handle the, the remaining 30% of, of users. So in the, those libraries that were on my slides, like uh, Strophy or um, JS Jack, they already uh, try to solve some of the uh, issues of different browsers in different versions. Try to be, they try to be transparent for the user and just to deliver whatever uh, stanza you have to deliver, uh, no matter what browser supports. And I think JS Jack has done quite a good job on it. Um, so maybe there are also some API functions within those JavaScript uh, libraries which <coughs> could help solve this problem. Uh, frankly speaking, I focus mostly on the server part, uh, so I uh, cannot tell from the top of my head. 
Yes? Do you need to use XML uh, if you use your private Mongoose instance? Uh, <coughs> do you need to use XML? In, yes. in what I sense? Could, I mean... I could do a protocol buffer encoding with the same meaning. Oh, yes, I see. Okay, so... Um, mm, well, when, for example, when developing WebSocket support for Mongoose, um, we had to add like new kind of connection which would connect over WebSocket rather than traditional TCP and it just happened to to use the same XML engine as the standard TCP connection so it was quite quite straightforward just take the message decode it from WebSocket and then pass it to XML engine as you would do from the regular TCP so I can quite easily imagine having another kind of listener which as we did for WebSockets, would we'll listen for, on some custom kind of um, uh, well, TCP port and would understand this custom uh, well, protocol like protocol buffers as long as it communicates with the rest of the platform in the same ma manner and uh, transforms somehow the traffic into internal eJabrd Mangoose uh, representation of a message, it should be good to go. Uh, internal representation do, does look like XML element, does look like a stanza, so you would have uh, Erlang tuples representing XML elements effectively. But those are simple ones, uh, so I think it should be also pretty straightforward to um, encode in a binary protocol, like protocol buffers, which I guess would be uh, for efficiency reasons, and then just uh, use the internal Mangus representation for uh, stanza. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you very much for so many questions. <laughs> <laughs>